Welcome back. Happy February. Uh, hey, happy February. We got the groundhog groundhogs done. Um, yeah. I didn't know groundhogs were called whistle pigs. Um, there's a whole story there. Yeah. Um, but we had Groundhog Day and we're into February. Yes, um, we are. barely into 2023. Yes, yes, we are. And, you know, this time of year, um, especially this time of year, we, we tend to hear a lot. Well, there's a couple of times a year, actually. It's this time of year and at the beginning of the school year that we hear a lot about uh, kids' behavior, right? Um, kids get into the school year, um, you know, in August and September, kids get into the school year and then parents and teachers start to have some concerns about what they're seeing in the classroom. Um, right. This time of year, we start seeing it a lot again because of testing and because, uh, you know, we're into the... I hate to call it the final stretch of the school year, but we're in the second half, and um, that's the way that many students, at least, see it. Is um, now right. we're in the 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 hall until the end of the school year. But we hear a lot about kids' behavior, and so today, in the next couple of weeks, at least, we're going to talk about um, one of the most prevalent and most commonly diagnosed conditions in childhood, and that's uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Yeah, besides everything else, you know, we're, we're also in what are called the winter doldrums. Um, yeah. It's especially prevalent up north where people are stuck inside because of winter weather. But, you know, the holidays are over and all the excitement of the holidays that, that occurred during school, you know, during the school year. And now we have nothing until Easter right. or spring break. And so you have this long stretch mm -hmm. of, um, of with no breaks. And that's another time when kids... Uh, you know, parents want to put this final push for the second semester, and kids are saying, I've had it with school, you know, I'm kind of tired of all this. And so it's a time of year when behavior problems are, as you say, behavior problems are more likely to occur. Absolutely. Now, so we're going to talk about ADHD, um, though many people who have been, who either work in the, the field of psychology or education or pediatrics or child development of any kind, uh, right. You know, you certainly have heard of ADHD, um, but, you know, you, you've said this many times before, you know, you, you feel like you've heard everything that there is to hear about ADHD, um, but we have, there's just another generation of people, of parents coming through um, who are experiencing some of these things for the first time with their kids, and sure enough, they are wondering what ADHD is all about, and surprisingly, a lot of them don't even know what ADHD is, they they right. they don't even have any idea what could be you know could be the reason or some of the explanations behind some of the behavior that we're seeing in kids. Right, and and we do forget because we're thinking, okay, well, goodness, doesn't everybody know about this by now? You know, it's been around for for many many years. You and I have been talking about it for twenty more than twenty years, um, and so you just assume that everybody knows about ADHD and then you're reminded that you have these new parents and they've never heard of it um, right. much of this or they've heard about it from a TV program or you know, yeah. they, they hear horror stories about medication and things like that. And that's that's the depth of their knowledge, okay? So they, they know about it, but they don't know much about it. They don't know right. enough about it. And they come to us with, uh, with fears about medication, with fears about what it's going to mean for their child's development and and future uh, choices, um, and they and it and it always surprises me that there's another generation here who doesn't has no idea what ADHD is. Right, absolutely. So so we're going to take a closer look at some things, and you know this week we're going to focus on you know what ADHD is, uh, right. but it, next week we're going to dive into. I think a, a, a critical import, uh, uh, topic, uh, an important issue that we're going to talk that needs to be discussed and that parents and, and teachers need to hear about. And then uh, the third week, we're going to talk about treatment. So, right. so let's, let's dive into what ADHD is. And, right. and I think that the first thing that we have to, we have to emphasize is that ADHD, true ADHD, is a neurodevelopmental disorder. Right. So what that means is that it is brain-based. Um, people oftentimes have a difficult time understanding what that means. It, it, that doesn't mean that you can go and do an, have an x-ray or MRI or something and, you know, there's, 
you know, neon lights that says ADHD and so that you can see it in a lab test like that. Um, but it has to do with the way that the brain functions and it right. is biologically based. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. When we say neurodevelopmental, we mean something early on um, that occurred probably maybe even precedes gestation, mm -hmm. but certainly during gestation. This is something that children bring and it is significant. This is, this is a significant disorder. There's nothing subtle about it. I mean, it, it is a it is a brain-based disorder. If it's true ADHD, and there's a there's a lot of controversy about that. Well, but if it's true ADHD, it is a significant um, it's a significant diagnosis with lots of important implications. Absolutely, and and I think that the the developmental piece, as you were just emphasizing, is is really important because. By definition, to make a diagnosis of ADHD, symptoms and impairment have to be present before the age of 12. That's right. Yeah, it, used it, to be, it used to be earlier than that, but now it's the age of 12. And that means that there's, we, we're not talking about adolescent, adolescent onset or adult onset ADHD because technically there is no such thing. That's uh, we, right. It, you know, it's not in any of our diagnostic manuals or, or hasn't been clinically recognized in that way. Right. Um, it, it is neurodevelopmental, meaning that it has to be present prior to the age of twelve. That's right. Development, mm -hmm. and and you you must um, people don't a lot of people don't realize if you if you make a diagnosis of adult ADHD, the process you use is to document that indeed the symptoms exist in adulthood, but that they also were present during childhood. Right. Maybe the diagnosis wasn't made. But the but the the symptoms were present during childhood. Right, the symptoms were present and and had some influence on uh, and function. it affected you in some way. Yeah. Right, and so so it's it is first diagnosed in childhood typically and lasts into adulthood. There's some you know um, there there's always been a, a little bit of controversy or or right. discussion about that because you know as we get older we can sort of tailor our life to live in, in such a way that the symptoms have less of an influence. Mm -hmm. um, and so it looks like it goes away, uh, but it doesn't really go away. It, right. it manifests in different, in different ways. Yeah. Um, but and the other thing is you know, the brain, the brain matures over time. You know, you, right. everybody knows about, you know, the frontal lobes and your mid twenties and all that business, but the brain does mature over time. And as it matures, it becomes more stable. Right. And so regardless of what disorder we're talking about, there's more stability at 25 than there is at uh, 12. Right. right. Because the brain, the brain is matured and is it, the, the mature brain is a more stable brain. Right. Absolutely. So when we think about ADHD, we're talking about basically three groups of clinical or, or diagnostic criteria. We're talking about uh, difficulties regarding attention. We're talking right. about difficulties controlling and inhi inhibiting impulses. And we're talking about difficulties uh, managing activity levels um, or being right. really active. Right. Um, and and uh, the diagnosis comes from some manifestation of, of characteristics across one or more of those three areas. Right. Um, now, it, it's, it's fascinating um, as we look at things because of prevalence. You know the we and we've talked about prevalence in in previous podcasts, but um, when we're when we're thinking about how frequently um, a diagnosis of ADHD is is seen, uh, it it is different across the age ranges. You know, right. it's not diagnosed as often in in toddlers because by their very nature, toddlers have ADHD. You know, they- yeah. the, terrible, the terrible twos and threes look a lot like ADHD, right? So, so what am I looking at here? It could just be the terrible twos and threes. So at the very young ages in, in toddlers and preschoolers, the prevalence is about 2%. Right. Once you get into school and the demands increase, you know, then, then you start having increased expectations and then kids start running into problems. So the, the prevalence goes to 10%. And as you go through the grades into high school and college, it increases to about 12 or 13% in older kids, right? Mm -hmm. And so a good, a good uh, metric here is that 
about 20 years ago, um, the prevalence in college students was 2%. Right. Uh, today it's 12%. So yeah. the, the incidence has really ballooned over the past 20 years. Right. And we have to be very um, careful about are we making, how are we making this diagnosis? Because how do we go from 2% to 12%? Yeah. And, and and we certainly don't believe, we certainly don't believe, you and I don't believe that um, the prevalence has really increased that much. Right. Um, you know, it, again, we're going to really emphasize that in our discussion for, you know, next week. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, 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 the fact that the, the prevalence rates vary in regions uh, as right. uh -huh. as they do. There, there are some states where you know, about 6% of kids right. are diagnosed with ADHD and other states where 16 or more percent are diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, right. Far and, more kids are diagnosed with ADHD in the United States than in France, right. for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so you have to, in some ways, look at the expectations that we're placing on kids and look at the relationship between that and the diagnosis or prevalence of, of ADHD. That's right. And I think that that state variance from six to 16 percent, um, th that's about expectations. You know, what what how do you expect children to act? Um, and it also has implications for treatment. You know, the right. medication use varies from state to state. So and that goes back to the idea that this is a clinical diet. Somebody is making a clinical judgment right. about somebody having this disorder. If you had a lab test, the, the prevalence rates would be the same across states. Right. There is no lab test. There's no x-ray. There's no medical test that you can use. So this is a clinical judgment and it, it will vary from state to state based on what the expectations are. Right. And just to give an example very quickly as well to what we're talking about with this, if you, if you live in an area where the expectation of kids is to sit and be quiet and, you know, only speak when spoken to. Right. The, the prevalence of ADHD or the prevalence of problematic behavior is going to be higher there than in states where kids are or, or in regions or areas where the right. general culture is, you know, the kids can are, you know, sort of free range kids, you know, they can just go, kind of go and do what they want to do. It's right. uh, adults are uh, more tolerant of kids coming in and even if interrupting other people and things like that. Um, and there are regions where that is acceptable. That's, that's okay. Right. Um, and, and those differences um, can result in the differences in prevalence rates. Now, that doesn't mean that the actual prevalence of true ADHD is different. It just means that the expectations that we have on kids is different. And so what we're identifying as problematic behavior varies uh, mm -hmm. across, um, you know, the, the higher the expectations in school, right? the more problematic behaviors we're going to see because, you know, even average uh, kids, kids who, who perform exactly where they should based upon their age, right. struggle in an academic setting where the expectations are, you know, one or two grade levels above, uh, right. above. So all of those factors influence uh, these prevalency rates. That's right. Yeah, you, know, you can imagine a kid, uh, a child with, who truly does have ADHD, if he's living in a small apartment complex where you want everybody to be quiet, you know, um, the, the ADHD is going to be a larger problem there than if he's growing up on a farm and it doesn't matter how loud he is and it doesn't matter how active he is because he can, he can be outside, he can run around outside. So it, it, will, look, it, will, it will look very different depending on the context of, in which the child is growing up. If the child is in a school, uh, in a school program, with lower expectations, you know, you won't have the challenges. If you raise the expectations and put them into a college preparatory curriculum, the expectations go up and the likelihood of um, having those behaviors is going to go up. Absolutely. So, so again, we're going to kind of get into more of that next week. Um, but it's just important to recognize that when we look at the, the prevalency rates uh, across um, across areas, right. and across, even across time. Right. Um, so with ADHD, and, and it's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and, and there are three subtypes. Uh, there's predominantly inattentive type, 
which means that the child has difficulty focusing and concentrating, but they don't really have issues with the hyperactivity or impulsivity. Um, there's the predominantly hyperactive impulsive type right. where they have issues with you know, being overactive and being impulsive, but they don't necessarily have the difficulty with inattention. And then you have the combined type where, um, you know, they have both inattention and some of the hyperactivity impulsivity. Right. Um, the, the differences um, are uh, why we get, you know, those, those reports from people where oh, they don't have ADHD, they have ADD. Right. ADD and ADHD are the same thing. Um, it's just depending on what diagnostic book you're right. looking at. Mm -hmm. um, but ADD is the same as ADHD, predominantly inattentive type. It's the right. inattention right. with the hyperactivity. So it, it's a little bit of vernacular stuff, but those are our three types, predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive, impulsive, and combined. Right. Yeah. So what parents are going to do is, you know, they have, let's say a, a family has two children. Um, one of the children, one of the kids is able to self-regulate even at a very young age. You know, uh, they have all the developmental milestones. They're kind of easy to deal with. Um, they go to preschool and fit in just fine and they enter kindergarten and everything goes well. And it's sort of this, you get this feeling that everything is sort of proceeding as it should. And then you have the second child and you notice things like excess energy. You know, they're just always on the go. And they're silly and goofy and they're always teasing and, and trying to, you know, be, it's, they, they tend to be a little bit irritating, you know, because it's like this constant stimulation. Um, they're always losing things or forgetting things or they don't put things away and they don't, um, they don't respond well to instruction. You know, you, the one child, you, you know, say, okay, time to put away your toys and she does it and you know, it's kind of a fun activity. And the other child just adamantly refuses and doesn't, it's not, not angrily refusing, just refuses, just doesn't do it. Um, they seem to be on the go all the time. They're always moving around and fidgeting and, and bouncing, their legs are bouncing and they're tapping their fingers on, on things. And they can't resist temptation. You know, they, they see something they want and they go get it no matter who it belongs to. And they might, they might leave it outside or they might lose it, but it doesn't matter. They also have difficulty taking turns. You know, they, they don't like to wait in line. When they go to preschool, they're always fidgeting when they're in line. They're touching other people, just being, being a little bit of a nuisance. They're not doing bad things. They're not doing dangerous things, but they're just being a little bit of a nuisance. And it seems like they never do what you want them to do. Okay. That's what you're going to notice. That, you know, that, that's your first sign that you might be dealing with something that, that might be ADHD. And I say might be ADHD because there are a lot of reasons why kids might act this way. Right. You know, and, and it's so, so funny because as you're going through, you know, some of those descriptions, you could, I, I remember hearing so many parents say, you know, everything works so well with the first child. It's like, and we're doing the same thing, but it's not effective. It, right. You know, this, this kid just isn't responding the way that our, our first child did. And and that is the way that it tends to to happen is right. when you have a situation where one child has ADHD and the other doesn't, the things that work with the non ADHD child um, work very well with that kid, but right. don't work at all with the with the other child because they're just um, they're just not responsive. And you know even even with all of that, you know you you described all of those things as far as you know being impulsive, having difficulty resisting temptation, appearing somewhat defiant even, the, the kid is typically like very pleasant and very happy and, and they seem to just want to have fun. Now, they can be temperamental at times. Um, you know, they can become angry or they can become emotionally reactive at times, but those are usually very similarly impulsive emotions, right? They, they happen and they're like a flash in a pan and they just they hit they're very emotional and then it goes away just as fast mm -hmm. and back to like their normal i just want to have fun i just want to play um mm -hmm. type of perspective and um so they're usually typically happy kids especially early on until they start getting in trouble so much that they become unhappy right. uh, <laughs> but they're typically pretty happy right and so you know they they we say they're defiant but we usually we usually condition that 
yeah, the word defiance, because they're defiant in a mindless, uh, you know, thoughtless way. You know, and you made a good point. You said that, you know, what worked with one child, you know, and parents will say that, you know, when I when I put my other son in time out, he didn't do it again. <laughs> I said, I put this one in time out 10 times and he's still doing it. Right. So it's not true defiance. It's it's mindless it's thoughtlessness. OK, because they're not attending. So it's a manifestation of the diagnosis. So you're going to notice these these uh, differences, the the intensity of behavior that you see in kids who truly have it. Because if your child really has ADHD, and, and this is one of the questions that we frequently uh, have to answer with parents. If your child really has ADHD, you, you're not going to miss it. Uh, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to wonder. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have to worry. You're not going to miss it. ADHD is not subtle. <laughs> there is nothing subtle about a child with ADHD. The whole world knows that the child has ADHD. It's, it occurs everywhere. It occurs in front of everybody. And it's there all the time. It, it doesn't just occur in school or when you go visit relatives or when the child is in church. ADHD is ubiquitous. It occurs everywhere. And the, the most important message is there's nothing subtle about it. You're going to know from a very early age that this child responds differently in his or her world. And, and that's why that's why we we add the um, or, or we're always hesitant just when someone refers to a kid with especially a kid we think may have ADHD as defiant. Um, like you said, you know, um, you might have to put the kid in time out for the same thing repeatedly. <laughs> parents will some parents will see that and say you know everywhere we go i have to do this i have to say that mm -hmm. it's not subtle you see it it's everywhere <laughs> um but it's not that the kid is just trying to upset you it's not that right. they're just trying to defy the expectations they are impulsive which by definition means that they're acting without thinking about the consequences mm -hmm. um and how many times do you say um you know, you can talk to the kid with ADHD and you ask them what would happen if you did this and they'll tell you the consequence. Right, right. And then five minutes later, they'll do it anyways. And then they'll say, ah, I forgot. <laughs> um, they do. That's the nature of impulsivity. That's the nature of ADHD. Right. And 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 so what you see as a parent, and, and this is the other with ADHD, we said earlier that it begins in childhood mm -hmm. and it extends across the life. It doesn't go away. OK, the, the symptoms may diminish over time, but it, they never really go away. Right. Um, but you will notice at different stages when when we talk about these disorders, whether it's ADHD or um, or some other disorder, mood disorder, anxiety disorder. If a child really has one of these disorders, one of the things that the disorder does is it interferes with normal development. I mean, the, the, the things that should happen at age four or six or eight or 10, the disorder disrupts that normal development. Most kids learn that they have to, you know, pay attention to the teacher. These kids, you get the feeling that they never really incorporate that. They never really internalize that. Mm -hmm. As infants, they tend to be a little fussier. They don't sleep as well. They're, they're more demanding. They get to the terrible twos and parents will say, wow, he got to the terrible twos and that became the terrible threes and he's never really settled down since then. Other kids settle down. You know, they go through the terrible twos and they, they self-regulate. These kids don't. And they get to preschool and suddenly the demands, the environmental demands increase and they have to get along with other kids and they have to do what the teacher tells them to do. And that's where you really notice the symptoms really coming, really revealing themselves because now the expectations have changed. Right? So at, at each stage, you can see ADHD interfering with normal development. My goodness, then you enter school. Absolutely. And, and, and so if up to that point, you really didn't have the clue. Um, by the time they reach elementary school, you, you really know. Because the expectation, um, my goodness, even in kindergarten now, the expectation is sitting still, you know, um, focusing and paying attention for extended periods of time. Um, and when kids with ADHD are in those kinds of settings, they just struggle. It's so and, difficult. It's yeah. so difficult being in those confined settings with expectations. And that's where they struggle the most. So right. that's why you can see the prevalence rate rise 
as they go through the grades. Absolutely, because um, as the demands and expectations increase, mm -hmm. their ability to cope with and meet those expectations um, don't keep up. They can't. They can't maintain, and so they um, continue to struggle, and 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 they struggle more so, especially when they're not treated. They struggle more so than than other students. Right. But when they get into high school, you know, the real challenge in high school is that. Um, they are recognizing, you know, certainly by them, they're recognizing that they treat school and they behave differently than their peers. Mm -hmm. um, they start to become even outcasts. Right. Yeah. And um, then you're they're at risk for, you know, um, looking at drugs and alcohol and cigarettes and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Not just because, oh, they're impulsive and they're, they're doing that, but Sometimes it's, you know, to calm down. Sometimes it's to, you know, my friends, their friends can only tolerate them if they have been smoking or something because that slows them down a little bit and they're, they're more um, manageable at those yeah. times. Yeah, we use the, I use the term nuisance. They're, they're kind of a nuisance. Um, I used that earlier. And by the time they get to high school, these teenage years where you're trying to fit in and you're trying to, trying to blend in with a group, uh, they become they're a nuisance. You know, they're they're irritating and they're loud and they're boisterous and they talk too much. So they start to become an outcast. And a couple of things can happen in high school. One is, is that they they could slip into depression because they are uh, treated as a pariah. And the other thing they might reach for is to treat the disorder that on their own. They're they're going to start self medicating. They're going to they're going to get into things like nicotine or alcohol or marijuana. Because they want to, um, they want to uh, attenuate. They want to diminish the symptoms, to decrease the symptoms, so that they can fit in. And they discover that wow, this this substance makes it easier for me to fit in. It calms me down. It helps me to sleep. It helps me talk to people. It relaxes me. And so then you then you become as a high schooler, you you uh, you have that risk of substance abuse. Okay, and then of course college which is, I call it mission impossible for these kids, yeah. because in college, you don't have all the structure, the external structure, you're expected to function independently. And that's the very thing that you don't do very well. Right. Yeah. Because one of those characteristics that you commonly see in kids with ADHD, or at that point, adults with ADHD, is difficulty with organization and planning, mm -hmm. and, you know, structuring their life in a way that being able to structure your own life. Yeah, it becomes it, a, a significant problem. They just can't do it, yeah. Um, and and so I, I hope that what we stressed here is that this is a real disorder. This is a real biological difference. In the, I mean, there's so much evidence from no matter what kind of, um, of technology we use, there's so much evidence that this is a brain-based disorder. There's, there's just no question about that. And, and, and there's nothing subtle about it. So when these kids are, we call it misbehaving, they're not doing it on purpose. They're not doing it because they're bad. They're not doing it to irritate you. It is irritating, but it's not done to irritate you. But it is difficult. It, yeah. This is a very, being the parent of a child with ADHD is, is going to be a demanding undertaking. It's gonna take incredible patience and a lot more time. You're just gonna spend a lot more time with these kids and you have to be able to do that. Um, it's not gonna go anywhere. Um, you're, right. you're going to be doing this at each developmental stage, okay? But it's not the child's fault, and that's why harsh discipline is not the answer for these kids. I know what I know. There's a temptation, but harsh discipline is not the answer. We'll talk about what the answers are in the next week and the week after. That's right. So yeah, next week we're going to come back and talk more about the diagnosis uh, of ADHD and some of the concerns we have, at least as it relates to you know, related to some of the prevalence things that we were talking about earlier. So um, check it out the podcast next week for. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So then with all that, that's it for today. Um, until next time, stay happy, stay healthy and forget to be afraid. <laughs>